Hey, Mike from It's Relational, thanks for tuning in. Coming your way in just a quick moment is a message on reconciling difficult relationships. When a relationship is broken, it's really hard, isn't it? It hurts. And sometimes it seems impossible. What I've learned is sometimes I've made the mistake of focusing on what the other person needs to do to change to make the relationship better. And what I've learned is that oftentimes what God wants to do in my heart is more important than what I think he should do in somebody else's. So get ready. I know it'll inspire you, but hey, don't forget to subscribe to this channel because I got all kinds of resources on marriage and family and parenting and just relationships in general, free of charge, and it opens up a world of resources to you. So just hit the subscribe button and now enjoy. Forgiveness is a work that needs to happen in your own heart prior to getting on this road to reconciliation. Now, I think what's common to all of us here is broken relationships. It may be, as you think of your life, your past, maybe your present, maybe a relationship with a mom or a dad, a step-parent, a step-child, a son, a daughter, an uncle, an aunt, uh, an ex, um, you know, whoever it may be. When relationships are broken, man, it makes it even more difficult. Relationships are hard enough <laughs> when they're somewhat healthy, like what's, what's normal? What's, uh, who doesn't have some dysfunction in their life, right? But when they're broken, they're bleeding, it makes it exceptionally difficult. Just like if you have a broken arm or you have a wound, um, you know, you got to kind of wor- work around it, work with it. You might not get all the time off of work that you need, so you got to kind of learn to work around it. Uh, you're going to avoid contact because you don't want anybody, you know, touching your wound. Well, isn't that the way it is with relationships and broken relationships? We, you know, we're going to avoid contact. Um, you know, we're going to protect those wounds. Um, in spite of all the, the emotion and the frustration I think part of us wants it to return to the way we were, right? The way the relationship used to be. You know, before I said what I said and before I did what I did, before you said what you said, before you did what you did, there's just this desire in the heart of hearts, in the soul of souls to to reconnect. Now, it may be buried way down there because it was so bad or... You're just a little confused on how to proceed, but every once in a while, it shows up, that desire to reconnect. And maybe you've made a few well-intentioned attempts along the way, but it didn't turn out well. Maybe it made it even worse, and you're not sure where to go from here, what to, what to do about that. You, you thought it would turn out better than it did. And, you know, there's enough blame to go around. Some of it's your fault. Some of it's their fault. But all that emotion is still there. And when, uh, when, when we make an attempt on, you know, to, to bring reconciliation and it doesn't go well, maybe we come to the point where we say, you know, they just don't care. I don't think they really care. <laughs> The way they responded indicates to me that they, they just don't care. And we kind of dwell on that long enough, and then we say, you know, I guess I don't care. If they don't care, then I'm not going to care. And, but then again, you, you start to think, well, maybe, maybe I care too much. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't care. Maybe the problem is me. Maybe I'm a little too codependent here, or I, I'm needing something from them that they're not giving, and so, you know, they don't care, I don't care. And then we get to the point, it devolves into, well, what's the point in even trying? It's not going to do any good anyways. But the, one of the reasons why it is so important is because that relationship, our past that we, we, we wanted to stay in the past, guess what? It just doesn't stay there. That's why today's story is so amazing. And it's so helpful as we look at a family in the Bible, specifically two brothers whose relationship fell completely apart. I mean, it got so bad that one of the brothers wanted to kill the other brother. Now, your family situation might be bad, but I'm not sure it's quite that bad. And I I think how they handled that, the work that God was doing in them independently and the work that he did together can be so inspirational to us to, to know a little bit about maybe what to do with those relationships in our life. Because 
really, I hope you discover today, and I hope I can communicate it well enough this morning, that what happens in the process of reconciliation is actually as important as the end result itself. Because I really believe this, that what God wants to do in you is more important than what you think he should do or he needs to do in somebody else. Just sit there for a moment and think about it. Isn't that true? Come on. Don't we have a plan and a solution for everybody else? But maybe God wants us to look at the work that he wants to do in our own lives. So this story is in Genesis chapter 25. It's about eight chapters, uh, and it's, it's a 20-year span. So I'm going to kind of give you the 20-year summary, and we're going to jump into a few verses that you can look up and follow along here this morning. But Abraham is a very imp- important person in the Old Testament. God said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, even though he and his wife Sarah couldn't have children. They're in their 90s, and all of a sudden, God blesses them. She gets pregnant, and they have uh, a number of children, but the two most famous are Isaac and Ishmael. And so Isaac, he marries Rebekah, and uh, they have two sons, Esau and Jacob. Now, these two sons couldn't be farther apart or as far as uh, uh, different from each other than, than is possible. Esau was uh, kind of a, a man's man, a woodsy outdoorsman. He used to go on hunting trips for days, and he'd bring back game. Uh, I want you to think of uh, Esau as kind of this guy, Grizzly Adams, right? Now, look at that beard, honey. That doesn't look so bad. I could look like that <laughs> if you wouldn't make me shave it. You know, really, it's, it's not her problem. It's me. After a while, I just get, ah, I go crazy. I got to shave it. But anyway, that's not too bad, is it? So, he, so Esau was, you know, he had lots of testosterone, a man's man, okay? That's Esau. Now, Jacob, on the other hand, he was the opposite. He was a homebody. He liked to hang around home, and he was a good cook. He could cook. He knew what to do with the barbecue. But now there's no reason that the text does not indicate any, like he's effeminate or anything like that. What I want you to picture is I want you to picture Bobby Flay, okay? Because <laughs> Jacob knew what to do with the barbecue. He could grill anything. And so I want you to kind of think of that. But uh, now what makes this story really the tension rise to the surface is that uh, their parents kind of played family favorites. We've got Isaac and Rebecca, the mom and dad. Well, Isaac loved Esau more than he loved Jacob, and Rebecca loved Jacob more than she loved Esau. Now, that's not fair, is it? It's, the Bible says it, they, it that he, they loved it. They, they played favorites. Now, so you can see the beginning of sibling rivalry. But And one time in, in, the, in the story here, um, Esau was going out on this hunt. He was gone for several days. And he comes back, and he must not have been successful because he had no game. But he walks into the house or to the tent, and he smells this wonderful smell. And sure enough, Jacob had been cooking something wonderful. And so Esau's like, oh, bro, I'm, I'm famished. I'm so hungry. I'm starving to death. Give me some of that stew. Now Jacob's like, hold on, hold on, brother. Listen, you want some of this stew? Um, let's see, what's in it for me? How about you trade me something for this stew? Esau's like, well, I don't know, I don't know, and, we live in different worlds. You don't, nothing that I have, you're going to really, you don't know what to do with a spear. What, what you, uh, so maybe Esau couldn't come up with anything to trade. So Jacob jumped in and said, oh, no, uh, I'll give you some stew, but I want you to trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Wow. What, what's the rights? It's, it's called a birthright. And it meant that the oldest son, the oldest son, that'd be Esau, would get a double inheritance. Now, it's a little different today. It's supposed to be a little more equitable. Everybody gets their fair share. I'm sorry if that didn't happen for you. But anyways, uh, back then, the oldest son would get a double inheritance. So, uh, And it could be sold. It could be bartered like we find out in this situation. Or it could be forfeited based on certain kinds of behavior. Somehow, for some reason, Esau agrees. I don't know, maybe he's just a self-sufficient, self-assured kind of confident guy. Like, I don't need a birthright. What are you talking about? I'm going to make it on my own. Who needs, I don't need a handout from my dad. I'm going to be successful. I I don't know. We We don't really know. But he makes the trade all over an appetite. 
Now, before you're too rough on the, on the young man who forfeited his birthright, a double inheritance for a bowl of stew for his appetite, before you're too critical of Esau, put yourself in the mix. What have you sacrificed as a result of your appetites? Have you sacrificed your health for another trip to the fridge? Have you sacrificed your integrity for a different entry into your tax return or your reports at work? Uh, have, you, have you forfeited your integrity when it comes to your relationship with your parents? You've lied flat out to your parents about where you were and who you were with. And so before we're too critical of Esau and we point fingers at him, take a look in the mirror on how there's been certain appetites in your life that you forfeited certain things. You've traded things just because of an appetite. Well, time goes by, and Isaac, his dad's getting old, and he knows that before he dies, he needs to not only, you know, there's the birthright, but he needs to give the family blessing to the oldest son. Family blessing. What's a family blessing? It's basically a prophecy of what is to come for you. This is how you're going to be blessed, and you're going to walk in the favor and blessing of, of God. So he says, I want to give you my blessing. You're the oldest son. You deserve the blessing. And so I want you to go out, go on a hunting trip, get some game, bring it back, cook me my favorite meal, and we'll come in, we'll eat that meal, we'll have a big ceremony, and I'll pronounce my blessing over you. Well, guess what? He goes on the hunting trip, and Rebecca, their mother, hears this whole thing that, that Esau is going to get the blessing, and that bothers Rebecca, and you'll come to understand why. So she says, listen, this can't happen this way. Jacob, you have to have the blessing. I know you got the birthright, but you need the blessing too. So if you play your cards right, when Esau's gone, you know, I'll slide you right in there. Your dad, he can't see anymore. I mean, he's blind in one eye, can't see the other. So, you know, I'll slide you in there and you can get the blessing as well as the birthright. And Jacob's like, is that going to work? He's like, oh yeah, we can pull the wool over his eye. You know, no, no problem. Just, you know, Put on some Esau's clothes so you smell like Esau, you, sm you smell like the woods, you smell like the outdoors. Uh, you know, he's a little more hairy than you, so go get some animal skins, put it on so that when he touch, you'll feel like Esau. Um, and so this plan is going to work. Now, what a conniving mom, right? A deceitful mom. But you have to understand something in the backstory is this. When she was pregnant with these two boys in her tummy, they were, they were, it was a fierce pregnancy. They were like wrestling with each other. And she asked, God, why am I having such a hard pregnancy? The Lord spoke to her. The Lord said this. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, they're going to be rivals. Yeah, Esau is going to tell Jacob, you're a mama's boy. Jacob's going to tell Esau, you're a dumb jock, man. You're big, but you got a brain about this big. You know, I mean, they're going to be rivals from the very beginning. And in the future, one nation will be strong in the other. And here it is. The older son will serve the younger son. So Rebecca was told this of the Lord. So for her whole, as she's raising these boys in the back of her mind, she knows that Esau cannot get the blessing. It belongs to uh, Jacob because the Lord promised me. So when she sees this whole thing going down, that Esau's going on this hunt, he's going to come back, and Isaac's going to give him the blessing, she's like, no, 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 this can't happen. And where she goes wrong, I mean, there's enough criticism to go around for the deceit and the lies, but where she goes wrong is she gets impatient with God, and she doesn't trust that God can fulfill his promise, so she says, I think God needs a little help. So she concocts, she conceives this whole plan of deceit. So sure enough, um, Jacob goes in, uh, Rebecca had prepared the meal, Jacob goes in, dressed like Esau, he smells like Esau, he feels like Esau. And the Bible indicates that Isaac was a little bit skeptical, but again, he's older, and he just went along with it. And sure enough, he pronounced the family blessing over Jacob, who he thought was Esau, but it went to Jacob. So Jacob leaves thinking, awesome, this is great. Re Rebecca, his mom's outside the tent. He high fives her on the way out just to let her know it went well. You know, I got, I got the birthright and I got the blessing. Well, just as soon as he left the tent, guess who's coming? 
Esau's coming back. He's got game. He prepared a meal. He comes in. He, he sees his father sleeping there because he had just had a big feast with, with Jacob and he you know, the after dinner nap. So he wakes up his dad, Isaac, and says, okay, I'm here. Your, your oldest son, uh, Esau, is here. I'm ready to receive my blessing. And Isaac says, who are you? Isaac, Esau goes, it's me, Esau, your, your oldest son. I'm ready to receive the blessing. And Isaac goes, no, I already pronounced my blessing. And in that day, your word was your bond. You couldn't retract it. You couldn't change it. What was said will be. Esau, he knows that his brother had tricked him out of the family blessing. And he's like, Dad, he begins to weep. He's like, Dad, don't you have another blessing? Come on, don't you have another blessing for me? And Isaac's like, no, the blessing already went out. Esau's ticked. Maybe he steps outside the tent to kind of cool off a little bit. Maybe he counts to 10. I don't know. But from that point on, the Bible says that Esau hated Jacob. He hated Jacob. And he makes an oath. He says this, when our father dies and after the days of mourning are over, I am going to kill. I'm going to kill. I'm going to kill my brother, Jacob. Well, his mom, Rebecca, hears this whole thing going down. She runs to Jacob. Jacob, you're in trouble. You need to get out of Dodge. Esau is going to come after you and kill you. You need to go. Why don't you go east to my brother Laban's place? Uh, You'll be safe over there. So sure enough, Jacob packs up a few of his belongings and he heads east and he goes to his uncle Laban's farm. And that's where he lives out the next season of his life. And what's strange is the Bible says that God began to bless Jacob and Esau. And when you read that and you hear these stories and how dysfunctional they you're thinking, God, how can you still bless them? I mean, there's lies, there's deceit, there's murder in their heart. I mean, and God is still blessing them. Isn't it good to know that God still blesses us sometimes, even in our own dysfunction? He, his grace overlooks things in our lives sometimes. He doesn't give up on us, does he? 20 years go by. They're very wealthy, they're successful. But then one day, one day, God goes to Jacob, knocks on his door, and he says, Jacob, it's time to go back to your family. It's time to return to the land of your father, your grandfather, to your relatives. I'll be with you, but it's time to go home. It's time to go home, which meant he was going to have to face his brother Esau, who had vowed to kill him. Well, Jacob uh, argues with God a little bit, and I mean, can you imagine him saying, God, why? I'm doing good. I'm content. I'm successful. I got a good life here. Why do you want me to go back into that mess? If it hasn't happened to you, as a Jesus follower, it will happen to you, where God comes and reminds you of a relationship that needs to be repaired. And why does he do that? Because you know what? Now that you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, guess what? You begin to see things differently. You begin to see people with, through eyes of grace, through eyes of mercy. You have more compassion. You're understanding what forgiveness is. I mean, you've received such great grace from him, and now you know that there's a little different standard of living that you have to live now. God will say, remember that relationship with your mom? Remember when you left, you slammed the door on your way out? You burned that bridge? You, know, you moved to Dillsbury thinking you can get away from it? Remember that relationship with that brother? You haven't spoken to your brother for 10 years, a whole decade's gone, and, you, and that relationship has been completely cut off. God will, will interrupt you. God will remind you in the middle of your blessed life about certain relationships that he wants you to reconcile. He wants you to restore. You know, there comes a time where it's time to pick up that phone. There comes a time when it's time to write that letter. There comes a time when it's time to have that awkward, initiate that awkward conversation. It's time to go home. And again, our pushback is, but it's not going to work. I I, I already been there, done that. There's no point in trying again. There's no point in knocking on that door. 
But I ask you, how many times did God knock on the door of your heart before you finally opened up and said yes to him? But he packs things up and he goes to see his brother who's promised to kill him. But on his way, he does a very smart thing. Look what he does. It says he sent messengers ahead of him probably to check out the relational temperature to see how Esau was going to respond. And he told his messengers, what I want you to do is I want you to make sure that you tell Esau this, that it's your humble servant Jacob that's coming to meet you. That's important because even Esau knew that Esau was going to be the servant of Jacob someday. So Jacob, he's going as low as he can go. He's saying, your humble servant Jacob is coming your way. So the messengers, um, they go and they give that message. They come back and uh, they, they deliver the message and they say, okay, Jacob, there's some good news and there's some bad news. What do you want first? Give me the good news. Give me the good news. The good news is Esau is on, Esau is on his way back. Well, what's the bad news? The bad news is he has 400 soldiers with him. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Jacob's terrified now. It's like, oh no, this isn't going to turn out well. But he does another smart thing. He sees everything that he has and he figures, I need to cut my losses. I need to divide up my family and my assets so at least somebody or something will survive when Esau takes me out. And then he prays a prayer. It's such an important prayer. It's a prayer that you and I can pray when it comes to these relationships. He says this, oh God, <laughs> have, you, have you been there? We're like, oh God, I don't know what to do. But you're the one who told me to do this. God, this is your idea. This isn't my idea. Remember, I was fine. I was content. But God, this is your idea. And I need you to intervene. I need you to rescue me. I need you to help me. Don't you know that God loves those kind of prayers when we come to the end of ourselves and there's no other options but for him to intervene? And that's the kind of prayer Jacob prayed. I need you to intervene, God. And as you look at your situation that you're thinking about here this morning, sometimes you're terrified over the thought of picking up the phone and making a call or sitting down and writing a letter or to initiating the, a conversation. It, you're terrified. It, it's, it can fill you with anxiety because, you know, it might not turn out well. They may hang up on you. Uh, you may write a letter, and they may never read it. Or they may fire back a letter, and in their response to you, now you're totally misunderstood. That was not your intention. Now, now you, it's just a bigger mess. And so it's, sometimes we just like, oh, why did I open up that door again? That, that person that you haven't connected with for a long time. Those children from your first marriage that you haven't really engaged or talked to for 10 years. And sometimes we're so afraid of, of what could happen that we don't do anything. And, and Jacob prayed, God, I need you to rescue me. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I need your help. I need you to intervene. But God, this is your idea. This is your idea, so here I go. You know, it's a step of faith. Because when you get on the pathway to reconciliation, you're not, you know, there's no guarantees it's going to turn out well. If you never take that step, you may never experience the miracle on the other side of it that God wants to do in you and through you. And again, it might not end where everybody's hugging and saying, I'm sorry. Oftentimes, these scenarios don't, don't turn out that way. But maybe that's not the goal. Maybe God's goal for you is to do the work he wants to do in you before he does the work that you think he needs to do in them. And you see, sometimes we look at that and say, well, I'm tired of working on me. I've been working. I've been going to church. I've been going to ladies' Bible study. I, I, I went through discovery. I, I've done all these things. I, can you shift the focus from me for a minute and put it on them because they haven't changed an ounce? Can you put the spotlight on them a little bit instead of me? God, I'm tired of working on me. And God's like, wait a minute. Before I work on them, there's some things you need to work on because you know, he gives us a ministry. If you're a follower of Jesus, guess what? You have a ministry. You're wondering what your purpose is in the church. You're wondering what your purpose is in life. Guess what? You and I have a ministry of reconciliation. 
That's our ministry. And in fact, that's what Paul is telling the Corinthian church. Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And what's that? It's basically not counting people's sins against them. Like God didn't count ours against us. We're not to do that to others. We have a ministry of reconciliation. But how are you going to do that ministry? Oh, when you're having a conversation with somebody who's really going, you need to forgive that person. But you have all this junk over here that you've never addressed. Oh, you need to do this with your life. But you haven't turned and let him do the work in you that needs to be done. Until you can't take somebody where you haven't gone. Until you work here. So this, so this relationship that you're dealing with, this isn't the only relationship God's going to have you reconcile or get on that road. There's going to be others because that's the ministry that we have. And if for that ministry to be effective, you've got to start here. And God's like, there's a work inside of you that you need to do. And that comes really crystal clear here. When we come to the moment of truth, the moment of truth, Jacob is on his way to meet Esau. Esau's got 400 soldiers with him. Jacob has no idea how this thing is going to turn out. And so he looks up, and he sees Esau coming with his 400 men. Oh, my goodness. This is, this is like the showdown at the OK Corral. Jacob does a very smart thing. What does he do? He humbles himself. He bows in front of Esau for seven times. He's trying to express as much humility as he possibly can. How is Esau going to respond? What is he going to do? Here we come to the climax of the story. This is where you break out the tissue boxes, all right? Here we go. Look what happens. Esau got off of his high horse. He ran to meet Jacob, the one who had deceived him out of his birthright and the family blessing. And he embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. Can you picture that moment? Oh, my goodness. What a moment. And then uh, Jacob, look how relieved he is. Oh, what a relief it is right here, okay? Oh, what a relief to see your friendly smile. I mean, I, can you imagine the relief in Jacob's heart? And so they have a few moments of some catch-up. You know, let me see, who's this with you? This is your family. Oh, this is my family. And they kind of catch up for a few moments. And before you dismiss this as a happily ever after kind of story, there's a couple takeaways for us here that I think can be an inspiration for you in your relationship that you're thinking about here today. And number one is this, and we've already alluded to this, that what God desires to do in you is more important than what you think he needs to do in others. Case in point, something happened on the way, when Jacob was going to meet Esau, something happened that we didn't, we skipped over intentionally until this point. Something happened to Jacob, something happened in Jacob, that if it hadn't happened, and nobody could have orchestrated this, if it hadn't happened, he never would have, he never would have got to the end result of reconciliation. And that's the same, there's a step of faith that you have to take without knowing how it's going to end up. But if you don't take that step of faith, you may miss out on the miraculous. Something happened. So Jacob is on his way to meet Esau. But before he meets Esau, the Bible says that Jacob met God. Jacob was left alone in the camp, and, he, and a man came and wrestled with him. That man was an angel. So Jacob literally wrestled with an angel all night long. And, and I love what he, he says here. Actually, the, the, in the text, it says that the angel said, Jacob, let me go. But Jacob said, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. Do you know that's the kind of tenacity that you need to have to reconcile relationships? It's not to let go of them. Now, at this point, you may be a little confused if you heard last week, because remember, I said, sometimes you got to let it go. Now you're telling me to hold on. Which is it, Pastor Mike? Let it go or hold on. Well, what you have to let go of is the offense. You let it go. But you never let the person go. The relationship is always more important than the issue. 
There's things you need to let go of and you need to heal from. But we should never, never, never close the door of reconciliation with somebody. Now, it takes two. You can forgive solo, but you can't reconcile solo. When you're ready and if you're ready, and when they're ready and if they're ready, then you have potential for reconciliation. But here's the deal. You have to start with the work that God wants to do in you. And something must have happened in Esau's life for Esau to be ready. The text doesn't give us his side of the story. We get to see Jacob's side, but God was working in him. And that's when Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob was a, a, a defender of himself. He, he, he'd lie to cover up his own tracks. But now God's saying, I want your name to be contender for me, contender for Israel. And so then a couple thousand years later, like last week, it would have said on the news headlines, President Trump and the United States broker a deal between the United Arab Emirates and the country of Jacob. It's not that, is it? It's the country of Israel. Everything changed in that moment of transformation when Jacob's name was changed from, by God to Israel. What's hanging in the balance for you? What are you forfeiting for God's plan and the destiny in your life? Now, some of you, you've been resistant to the things of God. You're here today. Maybe you're listening online. Arms crossed. Oh, this is so boring. When's that guy going to be done? Falling asleep. Resistant. You've slammed the door on a relationship with God, but I want you to know he's never shut the door on you. He's never given up pursuing a relationship with you. And you might be at the point where you're like, God, it's, it's too difficult. When can I give up on this relationship? At, at what point can I give up on pursuing this relationship? You know what the answer is to that? When your heavenly Father gives up pursuing relationship with you. And he's never shut that door. At some point when you come to your senses, and I believe it's, I hope it's sooner rather than later that you surrender your life to Christ. God, you didn't give up on me. And now we need to do for others what he did for us. Now, there's one other thing, and this may be the most important thing we can learn. So parents and grandparents, don't miss this. Another reason why we need to pursue reconciliation is for the sake of the next generation. It's for the sake of the next generation. See, something else happened in this whole story, oh, that you can read past. But when Esau, and only God could orchestrate this, man could not plan this out. So Jacob has his wives and his family there in front of Esau. Look what it says. So we see that his servant wives are there and those wives' children, but they're not named. Then we see even Leah and her children, but none of the children are named. But Rachel. And, and Moses, who wrote the first five books called the Pentateuch, this wasn't an accident that he did this. So there's something hugely important that happened in this moment. So Joseph's name is mentioned. And here's why this is important. Because this little Joseph who's sitting on the back of a camel watching this whole thing go down between Jacob and Esau, little did anyone know that in a few years from now, Joseph would be kidnapped by his own brothers, thrown in a pit, left for dead, and through the providence of God, be sold as a slave into Egypt, rise to become the prime minister of Egypt. And then one day when there was a famine in the land, all of Joseph's brothers who had threw him in the pit, left him for dead, would end up at his feet because they were needing grain. And who was the distributor of the grain? Joseph. But he's grown up now. They don't recognize him. But Joseph recognizes his brother. And he had all the power in the world to either kill them or let them live. But when Joseph was a little boy sitting on the back of the camel, 
he witnessed, he saw his own dad go as low as he could do and bow down to his brother whom he had deceived and he had lied to and he had stole everything that was precious. And little Joseph watched his own father humble himself and reconcile. And little Joseph saw his uncle Esau get down off of his high horse and come and, and embrace him and kiss him and hug him. And I'm sure Joseph heard that story as he was raised over and over and over. He had seen it, but I bet he heard that over and over. And 35 years later, he'd be in the same position with his brothers in front of him, and he had the choice. Am I going to kill them, kill the relationship, or am I going to reconcile and that's when Joseph said those famous words, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. Wow. So my question to you as we close this morning, where are our children going to learn how to fix broken relationships? From the pastor? From a book? How about you? As a parent, as a grandparent, we have got to do better with not living with unforgiveness and, and wedges and, and different things that we've allowed through the years and we've shut off our heart. And again, I know this is a process. It's not after this sermon or overnight. It's in time that this works. And next week, I want to take a few moments and help you to understand the conditions that give you the best success when it comes to actually now you're on the road to reconciliation. Okay, what do I do when I'm there? What do I say? What's my attitude? I want to give some help next week with that. But you have to first, am my, is my heart even open? Or have I shut it down? Have I closed off my heart? Who's? How do you want your own children to treat each other when they're adults and they have a falling out? Where are they going to see it modeled? How do you want them to treat you as you grow older? See, all this stuff hangs in the balance on our ability as believers, followers of Jesus, who are seeing things differently now. We're not perfect. We make a lot of mistakes. And I know I'm preaching this. I'm preaching this for myself because we, I got some issues in my own family going on. Connie's got some issues in her own family going on. And I, I've told the story of Jacob Esau before, but I, I, needed, I needed this for me to help me to navigate some of these difficult relationships. I know it's helpful to you too. And really, God didn't give up pursuing a relationship with you. So now, he's just asking us to do for others what he's done for us. It doesn't get any more simple than that. That's the gospel. That. We should never close the door on reconciliation because that's redemption. That's being redeemed. That's dead things coming back to life. It is possible. So as I've been speaking here this morning, who comes to mind? Who comes to mind? Would you stand with me here this morning? Oh. And there's no easy answer. There's no guarantees. But at least maybe what God wants you to see this morning is... Allow him to do the work in you first before you focus on what he needs to do in someone else. Amen? Father, we come before you right now. And like, like Jacob, we humble ourselves even before you, God. And maybe there will come, be, come a moment in the future that we'll be, have that opportunity to humble ourselves before that person to take the low road of humility. And again, Lord, we don't know the outcome, but like Jacob prayed, God, you're asking us to do this, so we need you to intervene. As you're working in my heart, God, I just believe, I pray that you're working in their heart and that you'll speak to me. You'll speak to us, just like you spoke to Jacob, that it's time to go home. Maybe the time's not right. Maybe the time's not this afternoon. Maybe the time's not tomorrow or next week. Maybe there's more work that God has to do. But Father, may we not kick the can down another decade. We know that your timing is perfect and you will help us. You'll be faithful to your word. 
And as you're continuing to heal our own hearts, we're going to be more prepared, more ready to step into some of those difficult relationships and bring reconciliation. Father, we commit that to you. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.